Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gyne, and today we're talking about trains, planes, and labor strikes. At the end of August, the 9,000 unionized workers at Canada's two largest railroads, CN and CP, were in strike position. The CN workers were locked out, and the CP workers were on strike, triggering a work stoppage that could cost could have cost hundreds of millions of dollars in economic damage. This was the first ever simultaneous work stoppage of the railways, but it didn't last long. The Federal Minister of Labor almost immediately directed the Canadian Industrial Relations Board to begin binding arbitration, and the trains began to move again, although the union has filed an appeal of that directive. Trains are not the only issue. 15 months of negotiations between Air Canada and their 5,000 unionized pilots now also appears to be at an impasse. The airline is preparing to suspend flights, and many are asking the feds to do what they did with the rail strike, direct binding arbitration. Like a rail strike, an airline strike would have serious widespread impacts on our economy. But is immediate direction to binding arbitration the right answer? And will federal intervention become a trend in labor disputes? Here today to discuss this are two labor law experts, Ryan Smith and Stephen Seiferling. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Let's talk about the rail strike lockout first. Ryan, can you explain what the issue was in the negotiations at a high level? Yes, at a high level, I can do my best. Of course, uh, I wasn't at the table and, um, you know, based on public comments and, and things that um, we've heard and we've read, um, I understand that it wasn't a traditional type of issue where it wasn't wages was the central issue. Um, I understand that uh, in August of last year, the federal government introduced some changes to the Canada Labor Code regulations related to uh, hours of work and rest periods. And that took effect in January of this year. And coincidentally, I think some of the negotiations started or um, I think some of the negotiations were in line with when that came into effect. And I think that it was related to rest periods, hours of work, uh, relocation of employees. I think the, um, the, the employers in this case framed it as uh, trying to create some flexibility and scheduling. And I think the union's response, they framed it as it was a safety issue and uh, they didn't want to make those changes. So, Stephen, the rail lockout ended because of the minister's de decision to issue this directive to binding arbitration. And I think, you know, many of our viewers might be familiar with back to work legislation, but this was different. Um, why could this directive be done this way to send the matter to binding arbitration and instead of, you know, having a vote by parliament? Uh, it's it's interesting that this was used because, as you said, the uh, the traditional way of dealing with this is through back to work legislation, where you have to recall Parliament and they uh, make a decision as a as the full Parliament on whether or not to issue back to work legislation. In this case, the Canada Labor Code, so that's the federal piece of law that governs labor relations, has a little section one hundred seven of that um, uh, of that code that says. The minister may do uh, may uh, require the Canada Industrial Relations Board, so the federal board responsible for making decisions on labor, to do anything that the minister, in their discretion, uh, deems necessary to maintain labor peace. I'm summarizing. I'm paraphrasing the section, but uh, it gives the minister a very, very broad power. And I know the provinces are going to be watching this closely because. If it's successful, I think the provinces are going to be looking at mimicking that legislation and giving their own labor ministers the power to basically end strikes without having to enact back to work legislation. It's um, it is a very broad power. And what the minister did here is the minister said uh, to the CIRB, I want you to do three things. Number one, direct them to get back to work. Number two. Uh, direct them to continue to use the existing collective agreements for CN and CP. And number three, you're, you're required to go to binding arbitration. It's the second time the ministers used that power. Uh, they used it with, uh, he used it with WestJet earlier in the summer, but he just directed WestJet to binding arbitration. He didn't say, we need you to go back to work and we need you to uh, respect the old collective agreement, the expired wow. collective agreement. 
So. It's, it's really yeah. fascinating because I think that this was a question so many Canadians had because we're so familiar with back to work legislation and this seemed sort of outside what we're familiar with seeing in, in labor disputes. We've got to go to commercial break now, but we'll be right back. 